Welcome to New Milton Baptist Church. We can't meet together, but via YouTube and via CDs posted out, we can at least share the word together. And this week, we're going to have one, there'll be one sermon, and we're going to then follow that with communion. So, so we, we can take communion together. But to, uh, we're going to begin by looking at the Gospel of Mark, and as usual, there is a first reading, so I'm going to ask you to look that up yourself. If you'd like to get your Bible and find 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and read for yourself verses 11 through to 21. So 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21. So you might want to pause the, your, um, your computer now, and we'll start again in a moment. I'm assuming that you've read the, the first reading from 2 Corinthians and now I'm going to read to you Mark chapter 2 verses 18 to 22. Mark chapter 2 verses 18 to 22. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting? but yours are not. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They can't so long as they have him with them, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a, pass, a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would speak to us this, uh, today. We ask that you would breathe that word into our hearts, that you would anoint me to speak, and us to receive from you personally. So we commit this time into your hands, through Jesus. Amen. Well, the Gospel of Mark contains the recollections of Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples. And over the last few weeks, in the mornings, we've been following Jesus' early ministry. This week, we're in chapter 2, Mark tells us that some people, we don't know who, came up to Jesus and asked him, how is it that John's disciples are fasting and the Pharisees, but yours are not? One of the keys to what's going on is that it is some people who came to Jesus. It isn't John's disciples, it isn't the Pharisees themselves, it's some people. They've noticed that John's disciples and the Pharisees are fasting. Their fasting is being done in public. Now John's disciples had reason to fast. In chapter 1 we're told that John the Baptist had been arrested. He'd upset Herod and Herod had arrested him. So the future for John looked very bleak. His disciples were feeling bereft. They had reason to fast, and it would probably have been expected. The Pharisees were also fasting, and that was part of their religious observance. The Old Testament law only prescribed one day of fasting a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. The whole nation were expected to fast and deny themselves. You can read about that in Leviticus 16. It was a day of focused repentance. The day when the priests made atonement for the sins of the people. Now after the people of Israel had misbehaved and were kicked out of the promised land and were exiled to Babylon, then they started fasting five times a year. 
But the Pharisees were different. They took it to the extreme. They didn't fast five times a year, they fasted twice a week, every Monday and every Thursday. And according to what Jesus says elsewhere, they let the people know. The religion of the Pharisees was a religion of doing. They followed the rules. They did the religious observances. They sought to get merit with God. So when these people saw that Jesus' disciples were eating and drinking and celebrating, when the Pharisees were fasting, going round with long faces and looking serious, they wanted to know why. Jesus was this great new rabbi, this miracle worker, this amazing individual who healed the sick, who cleansed the lepers, and claimed to be able to forgive sins, something which only God can do. He had taught about the kingdom of God, and he spoke with absolute authority. So if Jesus was so religious, why didn't he fast like the Pharisees? Well, Jesus' reply would have shocked them. How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? A wedding in Jewish culture was the ultimate celebration. It was a time of feasting and celebrating, and it would go on for up to a week. So no one could fast if they were at a wedding. And here, Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. The bridegroom was the star of the show. His guests were expected to be at the heart of the celebration. And the fact that Jesus had come to earth was a reason for real celebration. His coming is the pivotal point in history. He is God's promised Messiah, the one the Old Testament promised, the one the Jewish people were waiting for. He would restore the people to God. Jesus' coming would change everything. What he was coming to do was momentous, something really worth celebrating. And what he says in verses 21 and 22 make it clear. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment. Otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. An old garment, well worn, well washed, settles down. It shrinks to its final size. It fades. And if it tears, if it begins to wear out, you have to be careful how you repair it. If you try to patch it with some new cloth, cloth that hasn't been worn, cloth that hasn't been washed, it won't work. Because as the garment is washed, the new patch will shrink. It will tear the stitches. And in the end, it will tear and ruin the garment altogether. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wine will burst the skins. And both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Well, back in the first century, wine didn't come in bottles. They would put it in skins, in containers made from goat skins sewn together. When they were new, they were supple, they were stretchy, and they would expand with the wine as it fermented. But in time, the leather skins would harden. They'd stretch to their limit. So if you tried to store new wine in old skins, as the wine fermented and fizzed, as it gave off gases, as it matured, the old skins could stretch no further. The old skins could not contain it. They would fracture and tab, and both the skins and the wine would be lost. Jesus, the bridegroom, had come to bring us something new. He'd come to bring us something different. The religion of the Pharisees was all about doing and keeping rules, all about religious observances and ceremonies. But Judaism was never meant to be like that. The Jewish people were the people of God. 
created by God himself out of one man, Abraham. God loved them and he wanted the Jewish people to represent him and be a light to the nations. Unfortunately, the religion of the first century had become dry and brittle. Like those old wineskins, what Jesus was bringing couldn't be contained by it as it was. He hadn't come to bring us a religion. He hadn't come to bring us ceremonies, rules and rites, that's R-I-T-E-S. What Jesus came to bring was relationship. Those people who went up to him and asked why they weren't fasting could see that they were eating and drinking. They could see the joy that was in them. The bridegroom, Jesus, had come. Here was something different. Here was something that was worth celebrating. And in our first reading from 2 Corinthians 5, Paul was telling his readers what his motivation was to preach the gospel, why he couldn't help telling the good news about Jesus. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. And then he continues, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The, the old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, through Jesus, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Jesus didn't come to bring us religion. He came to bring us relationship. He came to reconcile the world, humanity, to God. In Jesus, God was reconciling us to himself. God made us. God loves us more than we could ever know. He made us to know him, to live with him, to enjoy him and to love him. He made us for relationship. But the problem is that we have broken that relationship. As a race, We've chosen and we daily choose to go our own way. We freely and often unwittingly break God's holy commandments. We're imperfect. Nobody's perfect, we say that. But the problem is that God is perfect. He's absolutely holy. And anyone who is less than perfect, anyone who is unholy, is unacceptable in God's sight. Anyone who is less than perfect is an abomination. Totally against everything that God is. And as much as he loves us, we cut ourselves off from him. We cut ourselves off from life. But God loves us so much that he gave us Jesus. He loves us so much. His heart longs for us. The heart of God longs for you. You and I were made to be in relationship with him. So in love, God sent Jesus for you and for me. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. He freely surrendered himself to the nails, to the agony. He took all your sin and mine, everything about us that's less than perfect. He was and is God. And yet he took all the sin of the world in his perfect soul and bore it on the cross. Such is his love for you that Jesus, Jesus who was absolutely perfect, bore all your sin and mine and died for it. Such is his love. So Paul could say, one died for all, and therefore all died. Jesus died for all, and everyone who believes, 
everyone who will turn to him, who will commit their whole life, their whole self to him, God counts us as having died with Jesus. Jesus died for all and therefore all died. We died with him. Our sin, all that's wrong about us, went into the tomb with him. Jesus was resurrected, raised to life on Easter Sunday, but our sin is still in the tomb. It's dead, it's forgotten, and as Paul says, God no longer counts it against us. And for all who believe, the moment we commit ourselves, something momentous happens. Not only are we counted as having died with Jesus, but we're made new, we're born again. Anyone who believes, anyone who is in Christ, becomes a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And at that moment, we enter that relationship with God. We're born again. God himself comes to live inside us. We're born of the Spirit. Religious observances, fasting, nothing like that can do this. It can only be done through Jesus. It's the reason that he came. Now years ago, I remember one of my teenagers in my youth group, he committed himself to Jesus. He invited Jesus into his life and immediately he stood up and shouted, I'm full of lemonade. It was as if that new wine that Jesus put, spoke about vibrant and living was being poured into that boy's spirit that moment he entered relationship with God he'd become a new creation the old had gone the new had come now we might not have such a graphic experience but the moment that anyone comes to believe they too become a new creation Jesus came to bring us relationship not religion. The problem is that in time, churches can become fossilised, like those old wineskins. Their religion becomes a religion of doing good works. Good works and tepid coffee, fair trade of course. And just as the religion of the Pharisees couldn't contain what Jesus was bringing, neither can they. So we too must be very careful to ensure that we don't become fossilised. God loves us and sent Jesus to reconcile us to himself. He desires that relationship with each and every one of us. No one needs be excluded because Jesus came for all. But we each need to respond to accept what he offers. He'll never force us. Jesus came to bring us relationship, to live with, to walk with God, to use an old expression. He came that we might enjoy God's presence, that we might live in relationship, in obedience to him. But we must keep that relationship fresh. God is a perfect gentleman. He won't force us, but he desires to draw close to us that we might draw close to him, that we might hear him speaking, that we might enjoy that two-way relationship that he desires, that we might live in his love and know it. And once you've tasted that relationship, that new wine that Jesus was describing, it becomes a foretaste of heaven. And that's what Christianity was meant to be. Not religion, but relationship. Walking with God, being guided and held and loved. Jesus was questioned about fasting. Now I do need to say here that he didn't reject fasting altogether. In fact, in Matthew 6, Jesus expects us to fast, but not out of dry duty, not to curry favour with God, Without that relationship, it would achieve us nothing. 
rather to fast, out of devotion, out of love, to draw close to him. Not like the Pharisees who did it publicly for all to see. But Jesus says that when we fast, it must be in secret between us and God. And Jesus promises us that our Father in heaven who is unseen and who sees what's done in secret will reward us. Fasting secretly can help. It can help us to, to, it can help us to draw close to God. It can enhance our relationship with him. It can enhance our prayers. But it isn't the means to that relationship. Jesus is the bridegroom, the star of the show, the centre of everything. And he invites us to his celebration. There's room for all. So I do hope that you have accepted that invitation. Heaven to come, but a delicious foretaste now. Heaven is to be found in relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all that Jesus died and rose again to bring us. That relationship that we can have with you through him and only through him. Father, grant us a deeper knowledge of you. Grant us that we might walk more closely with you, that our relationship with you might remain fresh, that, that that wonderful new wine might continue to bubble and, and stretch us and cause us to grow and enjoy that relationship that you offer. Father, we ask this in that precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to say, we're going to pray for our country and for those who are dealing with the coronavirus. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you, we thank you that your love was expressed to us so clearly in Jesus. That he died, that we might live. Father, that your love extends to each and every person on the face of this planet. And Father, we pray for this world at this time. This world which you created, this world that you love, but we have marred. Father, we pray, for, first of all, for all those who are suffering with the coronavirus. Father God, we would ask you to grant them your healing, that they might overcome this virus, this terrible disease, and they might continue to live. But Father, we ask for something even greater, that you yourself would draw close to each one, that you'd reveal yourself, that they might come to know you. Father, we pray for the peoples of Italy, and Spain at this time. Father, we pray for those countries. We ask your mercy upon them. We pray that your people will show their love to, to all, especially those who are suffering. We pray for our, for our own country and as they prepare the new hospitals, as the virus has begun to increase, so Father, we pray that you be merciful to this land. We pray, Father, that the social isolation that we're being called to do will work, that this virus might be burned out quickly. And Father, we pray for our country. We pray not just for their physical well-being, we pray for the spiritual well-being of this land. Father, we pray that you would cause your people, you'd compel us as you compelled Paul to tell others about Jesus, about that great love that you have for them, that they too might come and join the celebration. And Father, we pray for ourselves that you would use us, that we would not only be sensible, but we might, might be generous, generous and, mo and most generous in telling others about you. And Father, finally, we pray for this church. We pray for each and every member, each and every person that comes to the congregation. Protect them, draw close to them, that they might know your presence in their homes. And that goes for all who are feeling lonely and isolated at this time. That they too might find their heaven of heavens in you. And Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.